hello, online. Hello, everybody here. Um, welcome back. This is day two, week two, session two, whatever we're calling this, two of three parts um, of our delve into the role of women in the church and appreciate all that are here in person and all that are here virtually and those that will show up later. For those that are in the room, we added um, a better pickup microphone because people online couldn't hear the questions that were being asked last time. Hopefully that will help remedy that situation. Um, but that also means that as you're talking with your neighbor, that might also get picked up online. So just know that. Keep it the whispers to a dull roar. Um, so we started it way back at the beginning, literally in the beginning last time, and we're going to get from there into the New Testament this time. We won't get all the way to the end of the material in the New Testament, uh, but we'll have opportunity to do that next week. Also have opportunity for questions and answers after this session, and then again, more questions and answers next time. And uh, I'll let Jesse do all of his review, but before he comes up and does that, I'm gonna pray. God, thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity yet again to gather. Thank you for the freedom that you give us to do this and to worship and serve you and to learn together. I pray, God, that tonight we would do just that. Help us to learn what it means to serve you well. Help us to understand better what it means to be men and women made in your image. And specifically, God, help us to understand our roles with one another as brothers and sisters who strive to follow their Father God together. Help us to do that well. And we pray that your word would illuminate our path and that your spirit would propel us down it with all the energy we can muster. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thanks, Jeff. We are, um, we are jumping back into this, um, looking again at God's design for the family of God. That's sort of what we're after um, as we sort of try to talk about this broad um, picture of the role of women in the church. And it's going to look a little different this week than it did last week. Last week, we um, went through um, a, a good chunk of material and then left um, a portion at the end for questions and answers, really focused on the questions and answers at the end. Uh, this week, we're going to be going through individual pieces of scripture and then stopping along the way to delve into questions about those pieces of scripture. And then at the end, we'll come back and we can, we can talk more openly um, if there's other questions. Uh, we're, we are, like Jeff said, going to get into the New Testament um, tonight, but not all the way in. We're going to get into the Gospels and then specifically into Paul, but not into what are referred to as the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. We'll get into those next week, but we're going to get into Paul um, by the end. Uh, that is the hope, at least, um, if we get there. I want to start tonight, though. I want to start tonight with um, just reviewing uh, where we um, landed last week with some of the affirmations we took away from Genesis 1 to 3, some of the theological affirmations, just to catch everybody up to speed um, again. Um, some of the things that we said um, from these passages were first that men and women are equal in value and worth, looking particularly at the creation of man and woman together in the image of God, that they bear together that image, that men and women are equal in value and worth. And yet we said, as we especially tapped into Genesis chapter 2, we said that men and women are distinct in design and duty. They have different roles in this world under God's, um, under God's design for creation, distinct in design and duty. If you remember, we then turned to the fall and we saw how the fall does not abolish God's design, right? That's still there after the fall when God divvies out, um, comes and, and calls to account the man specifically, right? Adam, where are you? Um, the fall does not abolish God's design, but rather aggravates God's design. It does make it harder to live in God's world, God's way, um, because of the fall. It was at the heart of why we fell, and it makes it sure hard afterwards 
um, to live as we were made. That was as we, again, moved into Genesis chapter 3. But then we really looked beyond the fall and said that while the fall, not abolishing God's design, but aggravating God's design, still there is hope because through the work of Christ, we're once again empowered to live as models of God's design. That in Christ, we are invited to go back to the garden and to be, to be really exemplars of that garden life even today. Now, what is that design, though? Um, if you remember, we, we talked about it in these broad terms, that speaking about man um, bearing the primary responsibility to lead. He is what the Bible refers to as the head, where woman bears the responsibility to help. And that's sort of where we left off um, with these questions what does it look like for a man to lovingly and self-sacrificially lead? Where, what does it look like for him to be the head? And what does it look like, in contrast to that, for a woman to willingly and selflessly enhance that work with her help? It really was vague at that point, right? We dove in a little bit, but left that, those questions open to some degree on purpose, because that's where we're going tonight. We're going to fill out these pictures of headship and a woman's help, the role that she plays as helper. That's where we're going tonight. And I'm going to try to clarify some of the ambiguity that Genesis 1 through 3 leaves us with. Before we do that, I just want to ask, especially for those in the room, if you want to chime in and on Zoom, um, you can, but I just want to ask, were there any lingering questions, knowing that where we're going, that we're going to define these things, knowing that where we're going, were there any lingering questions from last week or, or further reflections as you had time to sort of process that on your own? And you don't have to. Hopefully you'll have questions later. All right, well, let me, um, let me get into this a little. Let me, let's push into the Bible a little. I want to start, though, before we turn to specific passages, I want to start by clarifying how the Bible uses this word help or helper, the word that really is, is thrown out there in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18, and then again in verse 20 as the sort of definition of the woman's role in that design, in that divine design. I want to turn to this word um, help, and it's, it's this Hebrew word, ezer konegdo, uh, is the phrase that's used there in Genesis chapter um, 2. This phrase, ezer konegdo, um, right? The drawing out the divinely created, divinely imaging, divine design for the woman. And we see it in in Genesis, again, verse, um, chapter 2, verse 20, 18, and then again in verse 20. Um, in verse 20 reads this, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, right, looking for that helper, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, it says, there was not found a helper fit for him, a helper fit for him. And that's this phrase, uh, it was not found an Ezer Kenegdo for him, a helper fit for him. And, and this can be variously translated. Um, we're used to this translation, a helper fit or corresponding to him. But really, you could, you could um, translate it otherwise. And um, arguments have been made that it would almost be better to translate it as, as a necessary ally or a necessary aid, carrying with it this militaristic term, um, phraseology, because that's where it's used most in the Old Testament. It's a military term. It's the help, the aid, the, the ally that comes in to, to, to give what, what needs to be done to win some battle or, or, or accomplish some task. She is a necessary ally. And you can see it used in that way most often about God himself. 
So if you're to turn to Deuteronomy, this is the final, the final verse of Moses' final song sung over Israel. And this is what he says. He says, happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your ezer and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you and you shall tread upon their backs. Why? Because you have an ezer, the Lord, a helper, the Lord. Or you could look to something like Psalm 121, where the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my ezer come? My ezer comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He is my help. He is my helper. He is my necessary ally. So that again, as you turn back, that's really how the Bible uses this terminology fleshes out what is it what does it mean to be an ezer and you can draw from that a few different things first that the term ezer this term help or helper isn't about inferiority or superiority right we've got to be able to say that right if god himself is the one who's who's naming himself as an ezer right all over he is the eben ezer right he is the helper right? This is not about inferiority or superiority. Now, there may be that relationship in some context, but context has to determine that. It's not innate in the word itself. This is not about inferiority or superiority. The term as a rather is about aiding the interests of another, coming to the aid of the interests for the interests of another. So the woman comes on, on the scene, right, is put into the garden because the man cannot do, right, cannot accomplish the task that he's been given by God on his own. He needs someone to aid him. He needs someone to come as that necessary ally to help him accomplish what he cannot accomplish on his own. This is the picture that the, the Bible gives and what the significance of this word is as it's drawn out in the scriptures. Does that make sense? This is going to be where I stop first. Thoughts and thoughts mean, do you have comments or questions? Thoughts? So the secondary term is specifically referring to that it is a helper who is yeah. fitter. Fit, right corresponding, that. matching. That's what that term, yeah, that, that second part of the phrase, that's what that's referring to. Does that make sense? So far? Okay, again, now at this point, we're going to start to walk through scripture and start to look particularly at the roles of women in God's redemptive plans, um, both in the family and in the broader family of God. And where we're going to start is in Exodus chapter 15, where we see in this woman named Miriam. Um, come to her own, as she's named here, uh, a prophetess, right? She was what? The sister of Aaron, so also the sister of Moses, right? The sister that, that saved Moses as a baby and the sister that later um, walked with Moses um, at, at the lead of God's people. And here's what we read in Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 to 21. God has just led his people across um, the dry, on dry land through the Red Sea um, to the other side. They've watched Pharaoh and his armies get swallowed up as those seas crashed back um, to their normal places. And, and Moses has just sung over God's people of the triumph of God, right? He's just sung this. And Miriam here takes up that song herself. And this is what it says in Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. 
It says, then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Sing to the Lord, right? Commanding these other women to join her in her song. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Anybody know um, what's interesting about these verses? What's unique about them? Anybody know any, anything, remember anything about these? They are a direct, almost verbatim quote from the first line of Moses' song. So that here, she is leading the women in the praise of God that Moses started before her. And it's an interesting picture in the family of God of how this relationship works between the man who, who God's appointed to lead his people out of slavery and the woman who, who in many ways is walking arm in arm with him. So that we can start um, sort of fleshing out what this looks like, that a woman here, at least in this context, helps by what? leading other women, right? That's what she is. She sings over the women and, and calls the women. It's particularly to the women, sings to the women to, to join her in song, right? Leading other women. But even further than that, we can say that she's amplifying, right? The voice of the one she helps. That's a great picture, right? amplifying the voice of the one she helps, drawing that out, making it louder, really, and, and inviting others to join her as well. That's sort of the first place we're just going to stop in the scriptures as we're trying to, again, tease out what this looks like to be a helper, right? The next place we're going to turn is to Judges. Judges chapter 4, where we're told this. It says, now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go, gather your men at Mount Tabor? Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, what? She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera, that's the leader he's going to go against, this foreign leader who's, who's, um, who's menacing God's people. The Lord, she says, will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, interestingly, the woman she's talking about is not herself, but who? Jael will drive the spike through Sisera's head, right? But then we read this, right? After all of that unfolds, that then sang Deborah and Barak, and Deborah's really in the emphatic position there. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel. Interesting. That the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. What can we say from this what, as we draw again out this picture? First, what? A woman helps. A woman, a woman helps by speaking God's truth. Right? That's what Deborah's doing under the palm of Deborah. Interestingly, Deborah is not said to have been raised up by the Lord. She's not presented as, as some... some um, 
as undercutting God's ways. But where every other judge or almost every other judge in the book of Judges is said to have been raised up by the Lord in response to the cries of God's people for help. Deborah's not said that. Almost, it seems, and it's been argued, it's almost a hint that, that this, is, this is not usual. It was typical that the judges of Israel were, were, were men of Israel who were adjudicating, right? Who were sitting in judgment over God's people and showing them right from left. But Deborah still, she's not presented as some, as some mischief here who's, who's taking on what she shouldn't. She really is speaking truth. And that is one thing that's given for her. She speaks truth to the leader, right? To Barak. But what else? Beyond just speaking truth, she's encouraging God's men, right? Barak's supposed to be leading. Didn't God tell you to go, right? She's encouraging God's men to go into war. And then Lastly, you might say that she's, what, at the end there in chapter 5, even taking on the role of inspiring God's people, very much like Miriam had, right? Now, though, it's, it's inviting all of Israel to join. Bless the Lord, right? Right? So we've seen Miriam, we've seen Deborah. Let me show you one other before we stop for questions. I mean, let's talk about the prophetess. Hulda. This is um, in the 18th year of Josiah. Josiah, one of the kings of Judah, um, coming after a litany of kings that did not follow God. Josiah came to reign at the age of eight. Now he's 18 years into that reign, so 26 or so. And he was having the temple repaired. He wanted to follow God. God unlike his ancestors had. And Hilkiah, the high priest of the time, were told found the book of the Lord and gave it to a guy named Shaphan, the king's secretary. And this is what happens next in, in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 10. It says, then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, gave me a book. Gave me a book. Shaphan began to read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And this is what the king said. He commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and then a number of other people to go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. Now, where do they go? to inquire of the Lord. Well, that comes next in verse 14. It says, so Hilkiah, the priest, and then a, a litany of other people, went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikva, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now, she lived in Jerusalem, it says, in the second quarter. They went to her, and they talked with her. And listen to what she says. She says to them what? Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, i.e. Josiah, thus says the Lord. And she goes on to, to, to assure Josiah that for the peoples wandering away, God will surely do what he said he was going to do. They will get kicked out of the land but that because Josiah is turning back, he will rest at peace with his fathers. Thus says the Lord. Interesting, right? Those words, you don't find them often, right? On the, the lips of a prophetess, but here they are, right? When they go and try to find, like go inquire of the Lord, figure out what does the Lord want us to do with this, with what we just figured out, found out, this book we just found, that's what she says. Thus says the Lord. So that we could say a, a woman, right? What does it mean to help? It's a woman who helps by speaking again, speaking God's truth. Thoughts?
Ever hear of Hulda before? Any of your friends named Hulda? <laughs> Maybe we should name some kids Hulda. Why? <laughs> why is Miriam called a prophetess? Yeah, so, yes, and why is she labeled it here, right? Um, what are the prophets of the Old Testament? Now, we often think of prophets as fortune tellers, future tellers, right? Um, the word in the Old Testament, the label in the Old Testament is more broader than that, right? Um, a prophetess or prophet is one who speaks the truth of God, right? And repeats the truth of God and, and in the Old Testament acts as a direct channel of God's truth for God's people, right? Um, now, sometimes that has to do with the future, um, whether it's predictive or whether it's paradigmatic, it's a paradigm, like this is gonna happen, you do this, this always happens, right? That, there's that kind of future telling where, I don't know when it's gonna happen, I don't know if it's gonna happen, but if you do that, this is what's gonna happen, right? But that seems to be why Miriam, why Hulda, right, similarly is our call of prophet, why? Because they speak the truth over God's people. Now that's different, right, than say the priesthood, right? which is interesting because the priesthood is in the Old Testament specifically limited to men, right? What was the priesthood? The priesthood was not just speaking God's truth, but holding God's people to God's truth and adjudicating that out in terms of, of dividing off if, if somebody wasn't holding to God's truth. It was the job of, of separating them out from the people of God making those distinctions, leading God's people, not only in the speaking of truth, but the teaching of truth and the explanation of truth, right? Sometimes you feel like a prophetess doesn't, a prophet, a prophetess doesn't even know what they're saying sometimes. They're that much, just simply a conduit, right? To God's words just flow out of them. Thus says the Lord. Oh, I didn't know he was going to say that, right? But a priest, a, a priest is the one who's explaining, contextualizing, holding to account. So for Miriam, she's operating in that way. Um, during that time, she's has that title. Yeah, I just was wondering if there would be any sense in which, you know, the nation is to, with respect to um, the last prophets who talked about didn't have any males, any males that they could go to because of the sin that they were in. So in a sense of it, it could have been a shame. Yeah, it could it could have been, and 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 some would like to say so. Um, one of the issues with that is this is during the reign of um, many of the major prophets that we know of, the ones who have books named after them. So Jeremiah is around during this time. Isaiah is, is there and, and operating in that even same context. Um, and so while you might want to sort of label them out, it seems like being a prophet prophetess is, is not a male-female, um, there's not a male-female distinction made. And that carries through all the way to the New Testament. So that Philip, who could be considered a prophet in his own right, right, appearing and disappearing on roads, um, like only prophets ever did, gives birth to four prophetesses. And, and there's no question around that of whether that's right or wrong, it's, it's presented as this is the work of God. God chooses who he's going to speak through. Now, again, there's a distinction, though, made between the prophets, prophetesses, that function in the Old and New Testament, and in the Old Testament, the priesthood, and in the New Testament, Eldership, pastoring, overseeing. And that distinction is very important. Why? 
We'll get to that. But this is held up as a, this is held up as God's thing in the Old Testament so far is what we've seen. Any other questions? All right, let's push forward. And I want to push into a, a passage that um, many of us know, but maybe it wouldn't come to mind as the first place you'd look and trying to discern the God's design for the family or the family of God. But it really is central to this. And that's the passage um, found at the end of Proverbs, right? Proverbs 31 which is both which is both meant to be allegory and meant to be just straightforward allegory in the sense that the the proverbs have already set up this this distinction between um, lady folly and lady wisdom from the beginning of that book and so this is capping that off with a picture of what lady wisdom looks like, but is really also the picture of what's called a, a worthy woman or a, an excellent wife. And, and there is a lot in here. We're not going to carry, um, we're not going to look at everything, but I do want to look at a number of pieces, um, beginning with... Um, this this verse 11 let me just read verse 10 it says an excellent wife who can find right and if, if this is still solomon or you could you could think that if this was solomon right an excellent wife who can find i've got 300 but wow the one right <laughs> who can find she is far more precious than jewels right but look at this look first at verse 11 this description the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. The heart of her husband trusts in her. That's the relationship, right? Between man and woman, between the ideal, right? The ideal man in his function, his God-given design, right? And duty to lead, and the woman who helps him, right? He trusts in her. It's a relationship of trust, right? If you're going to look beyond that, though, just look at just how active she is, the initiative that this woman takes, right? Look at verse 12. It says, she does him good. Verse 13, she seeks, right? Wool, flax, works um, with willing hands, right? She works. She, she is like a merchant. It says she brings, right, her food from afar. You can go on, just write down um, the line. She rises, right, while it's yet night, provides for food for her household, right? She considers, right, a field, and then she buys it, right? I mean, this is a woman that takes all initiative on her shoulders, right? Um, hashing out the household um, needs, right? And it goes further than that. She dresses herself, right? That's active right there. But look how she dresses, with strength and makes her arms strong, right? There is no weakness here. This is, this is not the weaker sex, like that type of language. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. And, and you could go on, right? She perceives that her merchandise is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night, right? She's the, a businesswoman even, right? On behalf of the family. Right, and, and you could go right down through. She puts her hands to the distaff. I don't even know what a distaff is, but there's where her hands are, right? <laughs> right next to the spindle. And then down at the bottom, again, verse 23. What a great verse, right? Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land, right? Her husband is known in the gates. What does this mean? She's freed him up, right? He's been enabled, right? The household is take, taken care of so that he can sit in the gates, which is, which is the place where the leaders of the community go and, and hash out what's what for where the community is going and what the community is going to do and how they're going to defend themselves the next time they're attacked. 
right? Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land and presumably known in part because of her, right? Right, because she's out there, you know, working her ways, you know, on the distaff or whatever. <laughs> but, right, this is interesting, right? She's taking care of home life and, and beyond home life, he is sitting at the gates. And this goes all the way through, right? You, you, verse 26, you read, she opens, right? This is even, right? It's not just, um, it's not just, you know, doing with your hands. She opens her mouth with wisdom and teaching of kindness in, is on her tongue. She's, she's known, right, for her wisdom and teaching. She looks well to the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. This is getting on towards the end of the passage. This is sort of the climax of it. Just listen to it. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Claim is to, um, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let her works praise her in the gates. The gates, right, where he's, he's sitting, right? Let her works praise her in the gates. What do you see? It's a picture of a woman who is incredibly creative, active, and enterprising, right? This woman is going at it whose help, right, pervades the home and extends beyond the home. But, note, for the benefit of the home, right? That's who's benefiting, right? The kids have food and all the servants too, right? Because she's out there selling things and, and, and putting her distaff to work, right? She, it's the benefit of the home, right? But she... Her, her influence extends beyond that, right, to the poor, that person there, even though she, she feeds the poor, right, beyond. And then you say, who is praised, right, in the gates by the man she enables to sit there. She's not going to the gates, right? She's not sitting down at the gates, right? She's enabling him to sit at the gates. But she's praised there, right, because of what she's doing that enables him to be there, right? Now, she may show up at the gates, she may stand at the gates, she may speak into the gates, but she's not sitting there. She's doing all the creative, all the active, all the enterprising stuff back at home. <clears throat> and if you were really looking, if you were just looking for a picture of what that is, right, a real tangible life-like picture of what this worthy woman, Lady Wisdom, right, what does that look like in life, where would you look? Where would you look? You know? Well, the Bible would direct you to Ruth. The Bible would direct you to Ruth. Do you know that in the Bible, now not our Bible, but Jesus' Bible, okay? The Bible Jesus read, which you would we want to read that Bible too, right? Do you know that in Jesus' Bible, Ruth came after Proverbs? So that Ruth is really the answer to Proverbs 31. Ruth is the picture. And do you know that the tie is even stronger than that? An excellent woman, Proverbs says. It's, it, it may be better translated, a worthy woman. Well, in Ruth, you read first in, in chapter two, verse one. Now, Naomi and her had a relative, right? They're coming back. They have no food. But it announces this early before the story even gets going about him. I had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Chapter three, though, that worthy man says what? Says to Ruth, who's come and, you know, laid herself at his feet. May you be blessed, Ruth, by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness coming to me greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. You are an excellent wife. That's the tie in the Bible. You want a picture of what a Proverbs 31 woman looks like? It looks like Ruth, right? 
even before she has a husband, going out on her own into the fields, taking the initiative on behalf of her mother-in-law that she very well, like her other her other sister-in-law could have left behind and gone back to Moab. No, gone on, attaching herself to the people of God, attaching herself to the work of the Lord, going back to the homeland, right, where there was bread, and then taking all the initiative to provide for her mother-in-law, you know, while Naomi's doing what? Sitting at home? Like, doing nothing, right? But here's Ruth, right, doing everything, and coming back with, what, six bushels full of, of grain that day. That's a ridiculous amount of grain to pick up one kernel at a time, um, right? All the initiative, and then all the initiative all the way through to attach herself to Boaz and land herself in the lineage of Christ himself. This is a worthy woman. This is a worthy woman, right? Again, back to that woman who is incredibly creative, active, and enterprising, whose help pervades the home and extends beyond the home for the benefit of the home, who's praised in the gates by the man she enables to sit there. That's where, that's where Boaz is going, right? That's where the story goes. He's going to the gates, and that's his fellow townsmen, right, who already know she's a worthy woman. Thoughts? Questions? Comments? I think it was significant that um, Ruth's worthiness was tied directly to God. It wasn't just that she and that's really what proverbs says too right because it gives this whole list this whole like laundry list of items that describe this excellent wife this worthy woman but what's the end of it right what was the end of um The end of it is what? Um, she fears the Lord. She fears the Lord. Where was it? Yeah, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And that's really where Proverbs starts, right? The beginning of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And it's exactly what you're saying, Ron. It's tied directly to her first in back in chapter one attaching herself to the people of god where you go i will go um, where you lodge i will lodge your god will be my god your people my people right it's yeah it's... question yeah so proverbs 31 you talk about the woman doing at home what enables the man to be in the gate do we extrapolate that to say then the woman ought to work in the home but not necessarily outside the home? Well, or is I, that a cultural issue? We have to be. Yeah. How do we how do we think about that? Yeah, it's a great question. I tried to word it specifically, right? Because it's you know she, it pervades the home, and and that seems to be her 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 greatest sphere of influence. Um, but throughout Proverbs thirty one she's well beyond, right? She's like a ship sailing on the seas is what it calls her, right? And she's, she's you know, buying a field and yeah, so her homeland ex expanded quite a bit, right? In that purchase and, but it is, it's, it's going and selling and then there's these verses of, you know, doing for the poor and it's not all like, you know, cutting a, cutting a, a hole in your, in your window and serving food right out, out, out that so that you're on in the inside of your home, even if you're, even if your influence is not, it's on behalf of the home. And home is, home is much bigger than the four walls that we often contain it to, right? Um, it seems to be primary, but not only. Hmm. So Sandy, one of the things that I have um, also kind of wrestled with is that so much, so often I've been, people that really receive the message that to be my husband's helper is primarily rooted in cooking and cleaning and laundry and tasks in my home. Um, 
And yet coming back to the fact that when when God declared Eve to be out of helper, like most of those paths wouldn't have existed, right? Like they had all the food, they just picked something off the garden, you know, off the tree. She didn't have to like do a lot to prepare this meal. You know, not like they didn't wear clothes and they didn't like you know, like so many of the That's true. <laughs> so to be done, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, so I guess that I don't. That's just a comment. It's an observation. It's a it's a wrestling. That that that's something that has always like. I think again, because so many of the messages that I've heard on the, on what it means to be my husband's helper have been tied to those tasks. Right. Has had this little dissonance of like, but wait, when God gave Eve that job, most of those tasks didn't exist. Right. And so that like. That's part, part, partly been a little bit of my, like, um, the, the battle I've done with, with the way the Proverbs 31 woman has been presented to me. Because as you're unpacking it, it's obviously more than those tasks yeah. in the home. Um, but I feel like even that's been used to push that, like, that's my primary. Yeah, it's, it's hard, right? And maybe this is just another place where you see the curses of Genesis 3 being played out, where we, we wrestle against the imagery in so many ways, but we also wrestle against just even what's natural. And I mean, if you were gonna like sort of press into sort of a, a, a Catholic way of doing natural theology, right? Um, there's, there is a place, right? It's not to disparage the work of the home and and, and for many women, that, that does become the place they flourish most. That's not to, that's not to downplay that. Um, I mean, you, you are the one that bears the child. And, 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 and golly, at least in month nine, you are homebound, whether you like it or not, right? I mean, you can't, like, move. Um, but, um, and, but, but even beyond that, right, when, of the raising of, of kids and the nurturing side, this isn't to disparage that. It's just to say, maybe, maybe we've pigeonholed it too much. Um, you know, the, 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 we, think, we think of it as just make the meals, just do the laundry. And, and it seems like it's so much more. And there's more, there, there's more that it encompasses for the health of the husband, right? When knowing God's coming for him in the end, but... I mean, you got a husband, right? Who has a business, and 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 that's not that's not territory that that you know he can't invite you into for the good of the business that your husband runs, or 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 um, or, or vice versa, right? Um, and and it's not to say you couldn't have an Etsy shop and and sort of be, be doing you know gangbusters there or or more, um, but there is while trying to deconstruct the pigeonhole that we've made um i think we do want to continually recognize oh yeah but uh, amidst the equality of strength and abilities and and god you know god imaging of, of creativity and and all the wonderful things that go with that let's not miss miss because we want to swing the pendulum that way let's not miss the distinctions in design and duty which calls for or lines there are lines and to say that there are no lines i think would be just as just as much a disservice as drawing those lines in the wrong place anybody else i actually want to follow that up just because i i've heard the same things that amber's talking about you know using proverbs 31, using other scriptures to say, you know, that's your job is to cook and clean. But I've also heard Proverbs 31 used as the checklist and, and leaving literally a room full of women in tears that they can't measure up to Proverbs 31. So this is slightly off topic, but I just feel like it needs to be addressed. That this is not the, you need to do all this in order to be the right. worthy woman. Right. This is like you started out by saying, it is allegory as well as reality. Right. And, and this is a poetic... Um, Idealization. I, yes. Yep. This is the ideal that... Yes. So yeah. this is not the checklist that you have to achieve. Yeah. It's worth saying. Yeah. 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 Anybody else?
All right, so that's Proverbs and Ruth. I want to then now turn from there and, and turn the, the sort of leaf of the Bible into um, the New Testament. And where I want to start is um, I want to start with women in um, the Gospels. And we don't really have time to look at all the places in Jesus' life and ministry that he affirmed the intrinsic value of women, ministered to, in particular, ways to women, and, and really upheld their dignity in a society that, quite frankly, just didn't. Um, but I do want to look at just a, a, a moment, for just a moment, at the role women played at the end of the gospel, specifically in the wake of the resurrection. And this is significant because it is agreed on by all four of them that when Jesus rose again, it wasn't his disciples who first witnessed the empty tomb or bore witness to it, but women. And so I just want to look at this just quickly because it, it's important just to, again, color what is and isn't being said by the Bible um, about the role of women in the family and in the family of God, really, at, the, at this point. Um, and you could pick up somewhere like Mark, right? Um, this is the end of Mark, last chapter, Mark, uh, Mark uh, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Um, these really were the concluding verses of Mark, right? Verses 9 and following are not in any early manuscript that we have and probably should not be read as part of that gospel, no matter how abrupt verse 8 seems as an ending. Uh, this is, though, this is how it, it would have ended, um, starting in um, verse 1, um, when the Sabbath was passed, we're told that Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, so another Mary, and uh, Salome, uh, bought spices um, so that they might go and anoint Jesus, right, his body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone for us um, from the entrance of the tomb, right? Who will roll it away? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large, in case you were wondering. And then this. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. They didn't know who this guy was. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Right? Verse 8, then, this is the abrupt ending. And they went out and fled from the tomb, um, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, right? But what was the command? Go and tell. Go and tell. Now, Matthew picks up on this, fleshes out apparently after they got over the fear and trembling, and this is what we're told in Matthew. Very similarly, right, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and others with them, apparently, went to see the tomb. A great earthquake came. An angel from the Lord descended from heaven, came, rolled back the stone. Oh, that's who rolled it back. Sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guard trembled, became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, what? The angel said this. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. He has risen as he said. Now, this is what the angel says. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go, quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Now, they actually go. They, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear, right, that fear, but also great joy, Matthew says. They ran to tell his disciples, behold, as they were going, Jesus met them, said, greetings. And they <laughs> came up and took hold of his feet, worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, what? Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, right? 
and there they will see me. Now, interesting Jesus words, right? The angel just says, um, go tell them that he is going, right? This is just fact. What does Jesus say? No, go and command them to go, right? It's interesting, right? It's just worth noting, right? Because we get, we get upset about this, but Jesus commands them to go command the disciples, right? Passing on the command of Jesus. And this is part of what women do. This is Jesus, for goodness sake, right? And so we could say that a woman helps, right? We're looking for that picture of what a helper is. A woman helps by bearing witness to what she has seen and heard, right? That's the function. They're the first witnesses. And, you know, through that, com by commanding others to follow the commands of Jesus, right? That's the relationship here that we're trying to make sense of. Like, oh, there's got to be a place for that, right? Now, it's not saying more than that, but at least passing on, right? Speaking the word. And this this functionally, like being a witness for Jesus, sort of in our best way of sort of making sense for this, this is part of that broad category of prophesying in the Old Testament, of truth telling, right? Bearing witness to what you have seen and heard, right? And then passing on, right? It's not that, you know, it's not in the New Testament that a woman cannot speak truth. If she's expected to speak truth. Now, where the line is, that's important. Now, saying there's not a line, but this is from these texts and from Jesus' own words. Does that make sense? What are your thoughts? Says, do not be like afraid. Is that, is that kind of like he's kind of comforting them or kind of like the angel or Jesus? They both they both say Jesus. Yeah, I think he's trying to get them over probably of the fear that they had because of the angel, right? <laughs> and maybe because oh, I'm here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's com comfort's probably a good good way to put that, just at a base level at least. So that makes sense broadly, at least again, this is the end of Jesus' ministry. This is not to say anything of the, the just pretty radical way Jesus treated women generally, right? As his followers, right? Acknowledging them as part of the family and an essential part of the family, right? Um, they too, like they will for Paul, like being his patrons, right? In a lot of ways, women carried the day for some of that, right? You know, their fingers on their distaffs and whatever they were making with that, paying for, you know, Jesus and, and, and Paul afterwards, right, to, to do the work of the ministry. Um, this is nothing to say to get into that. We don't have time to look at all of it, but, um, but at least at the end, this is a central piece and a central piece of our, of our faith. Now, interestingly, when you get to 1 Corinthians, right, and Paul lays out the tradition, right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, who does he lay out as the witnesses to the resurrection? Right, James, the 12, right, 500 others, last of all me. The women aren't included in the official list. Why? Because they really wouldn't have mattered, right, in official testimony, right? The day wouldn't have cared, right? But Jesus cared, right? He valued women. He valued them. And obviously. And interestingly, right, wove that in to the story um, four times. There is not many. There are there are maybe two, two life um, occurrences aside from the cross in Jesus' ministry, um, life and ministry, that are found in every gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Feeding of the 5,000, walking on water maybe, right? Um, not much else, but all of them agree that the women were there first and were not only there first, but commanded to go, right? Go and tell, commissioned. Does that make sense? All right, now again, 
we're, we're, th this is meant to be somewhat ambiguous still, right? Because we're, we're, looking at, um, we're, we're, we're looking at where the line is not. Now we're gonna get towards where the line is, okay? And the one who helps us most with that is the Apostle Paul. Why? Because the Apostle Paul was a misogynistic, you know, something or other? No, that's not why. It's because Paul was commissioned by God and really used by God to, to show the lines, right? Where are the lines? To correct where the church is trying to sort of make its way in the first century after Jesus, Paul was instrumental in clarifying things, whether it was the gospel itself, right? Romans, Galatians, or all of the dynamics that happen within the family of God. So Paul really gives us the clearest um, places, the clearest explanations of where the lines are and where they aren't, right? He's really the one that flushes out. And the first place we're going to stop is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, okay? And this is where we just get into some of the meteor stuff. And uh, um, again, I'm, we're going to go through some of this, um, and then next week we'll pick up in uh, the pastorals, which is Paul's letter to his protégés, um, Titus and Timothy, okay? This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, though, and um, Paul's really laying out in Corinthians, um, writing to the church of Corinth, um, he's, he's laying out for them what they got right and, and, and a lot of things they got wrong, right? Um, and he starts out in 1 Corinthians chapter, 10, um, chapter 1, verse 10. It's really his, his theme verse for the entire um, book. Let there be no divisions among you, right? And I'm going to tell you where we ought to be united on, right? Be no divisions among you, and I'm going to tell you where we're coming around, okay? And if you don't come around, that's the divisions, and hey, we have problems, right? So he clarifies a number of issues, beginning way back in the beginning with who you're going to follow, right? Not me, not Peter right? Who are you going to follow? We got to follow Jesus. But even the people were saying, we follow Jesus. You're even wrong because you don't get it, right? Even you are not really following Jesus in that instance because you're dividing over him rather than uniting around him, right? Jesus is, is more than that. Um, so it starts with there. It goes into issues of, um, of marriage and sexuality and, um, and, and, um, and other practices that are going on that Paul says, this should not be so, all the way up to chapter 11, um, where Paul starts out with this verse, which is sort of like just a, to trying to pat them on the back a little bit and say, now I commend you because you remember me and everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. Good job. Now let's talk about what you're doing wrong. Okay. Verse three is really the crux of, um, of, of what he's talking about here. He says, but, right? Oh, good job. But, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every wife is her husband, and the head of every and the head of Christ is God. And we've got headship issues, right? That's what he's telling them in Corinth. You've got headship issues, and I'm going to just sort of start to flesh that out for you. This is the key verse in his um, argument, and it's all about this language of headship, which is if, if you don't, if you can't see the allegory or the, the, the metaphor, this is about authority, right? Who is in charge, right? Who bears responsibility and who gets to set the direction of what's happening when, where, and whatever, right? Now, you got issues, right? Because you're not following me in this. He's later going to say, it's, you, if you don't follow me, you're against all the other churches because everybody else, this is how we operate and you're not doing it. So you got to get in line, right? get in line. But it's about this headship, this authority, and particularly in verse um, four. It's about the issue of headship, right? Who's the head and how the head is working and whatnot, uh, when it comes to praying and prophesying. And he's at this point talking about the public gathering of God's people. He's going to talk about the public gathering of God's people from chapter 11 here all the way through to chapter 14 all the way through. This is sort of where he goes. It's the last major issue he's talking about in the life of the family of God before he gets to chapter 15, the resurrection, right? This is the, this is the one he's coming down on, and the really one he's going he's gonna to talk about for the most extended period of time. And to begin with, it's about praying and prophesying. Again, in the public gathering of God's people, praying and prophesying, whether you're a man, right, who 
with it, he's not supposed to cover his head because he dishonors it, or a woman who, who um, with her head uncovered, right? If she uncovers her head, she dishonors it. Praying and prophesying in a specific way with your head covered or not covered, okay? And that may sound strange, right? Does it sound strange? It should sound strange because it seems, as best we can tell, a very culturally um, particular issue or a culturally particular issue. The principle of which, though, is just as applicable to us today. A cultural issue that he's trying to um, hash out in a culturally um, particular way that has you know, a cultural, broader than just one culture, implications, okay? It's all to do with praying and prophesying that they're, that they're not, and this point is that they're not in their appearance, right? In how they are, they look, right? Covering or uncovering the head, whether that's hair or not hair, or, or actually a shawl or not a shawl, right? It's all these things, everybody argues about this. What, what was it? Nobody knows really, but if it's any of these things, but in their appearance, this is clear, that in their appearance, men or women, will negate by how they look the authority structure set up by God himself. Now, for the Corinthians, this related directly to how men and women wore their hair or covered their hair, okay? For us, in our culture, you probably wouldn't make the same argument related to somebody's hair. You wouldn't. Now, some people would say, don't have long hair, right? Some people would say to a woman, don't have short hair, right? And some people still make that argument, and, and we can hear that. But in today's day and age, that is not as important, right? That is not where the line does, is drawn. That's, 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 that's certainly not if you were to walk into a, a culture that did not come through the, the, um, the Christianization of the West, right? Certainly not what you would try to argue to if you were in some um, Native American context where they hadn't heard about Jesus before. You wouldn't tell all the, the, the chiefs of the, of, the, of, the, of the tribe that they're now dishonoring their head by their hair being long. This is not the argument you would make for them. Back in Corinth, though, it was. For us in our culture, though, you probably wouldn't make that argument about someone's hair, but you could very well apply the principle in such a way that would suggest that when men and women pray or prophesy, bigger picture, participate in public worship, most particularly in the public worship of God's people, right? They are not in their appearance to blur the lines between male and female. Why? Because blurring the lines in their physical appearance would functionally disregard the authority structure of the family and the family of God. So if I was just going to give a very clear example that I don't know if anybody would push back on this. If a woman gets up there with short haircut, fine. On a Sunday, if a woman gets up on a Sunday morning with a gathered people of God, whether that's in a home group or in, or in, the, um, or in, in our worship gathering on Sunday, in a suit and tie, there's a problem, right? Because they're functionally blurring the line between male and female and the, again, distinct designs and duties given over to one or the other. Physical appearance, functionally disregarding <clears throat> a spiritual truth. Undoing what? Creation, right? And that's where Paul grounds this. We could walk through the argument, but that's really where he grounds it, right back in Genesis chapter 2. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That's Genesis 2 argument. Now, Paul's going to get to saying, and yet I know that there is equality here, really giving a nod back to the fact that Women are invited to participate in the worship of God. That's why down here he's going to say, nevertheless, 
in the Lord. Woman is not independent of man or a man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, right? We can't like, you can't just say that woman's not important. Just stay home. Please don't worship with us. Don't participate. That's not what Paul's saying. He knows that this line only goes so far, but he is saying that even as Genesis 1, we affirm that men and women are equal in value and worth. We need to maintain the fact that under God, from creation, not the fall, they are distinct in design and duty. And again, we could go all the way through, but what would we say? Well, from 1 Corinthians 11, that a woman helps, right? What does this helper mean? Helps by praying and prophesying in the public worship of God's people. More generally, you would say by participating in the public worship of God's people. But where's the line? Affirming, hey, if you just want a real direct application, affirming in her appearance, right, the God-given responsibilities of men, and particularly the men she is under, whether it's her husband, her father, or the men that have been appointed to lead the body of Christ, right? The big brothers who are, you know, while dad's away, operating as the fathers of the family. Participating, but doing so in such a way that maintains the distinction, that does not cross the line, even in their physical appearance. Thoughts? So it seems like it's a very um, culturally driven perspective on like what it would look like to like in, be in appearance as a man. So like, I'm grappling with like the church I went to in college at one point, um, on like a school field trip in one of my classes, where the, like we were told you can wear pants, but they're going to condemn you because you're dressing like a man because women wear skirts. Like, where do you like? How do you draw that line? Like, the, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, and and that line has shifted even between when you were a kid and where we are today. Um, and the question is open, I think. Um, but in this instance, what's Paul getting at? I don't think it's entirely this, but you could, you could say that behind it is there's a whole lot of intention, right? And you can dress up in a suit and tie to take on the prominence of a man, right? To present yourself with the, right, with the masculine um, you know, traits that will win you honor in the workplace or honor in the family of God, right? Or the intention of, hey, I'm going to embrace my feminine side. I'm going to embrace my masculine side. Not because that's really the point, but because we're maintaining the distinctions between roles and responsibilities. It's not, I don't think it's easy. Not too long ago, though, I mean, I, a, a family who's, where does this connect even with the modesty questions, right? Not too long ago, I was struck in public um, thinking I was about to run into um, an individual I knew, a, a, a daughter of a friend who, um, who was in her work clothes and, uh, and went to say hi and found out that I was looking at a handyman. The lines blurred a little bit, maybe too much in that instance. What's the intention though? Oh, it's probably on the modesty side of the thing. I want to be modest, right? I'm wearing pants and I want it to be skin tight or, or, or that. Um, I don't think it's easy to navigate that. And thankfully, we're not trying to figure that out tonight. Um, 
I think it's all that to say, it's a good question. I think it's something we need to wrestle through. And how do we make sense of 1 Corinthians 11? Some take this in the other direction. Catherine and I have good family and friends who take it in the other direction and say, I don't know what he meant, but when I brand prophesy, I'm going to put something on my head, which is fine. And yet, is that really what Paul is saying? And does that even honor what Paul was saying? Because you can have something on your head and still dishonor the head above you. Or you can be a man without anything on your head and dishonor just as much as well. Um, that's as best as I can make sense of it. And I think does it justice. Physical appearance, though. I mean, it's, it's like, is that what we were going to talk about tonight? And yet that's a piece of the puzzle, right? Not even, not blurring the distinction there, right? So that we're keeping and regarding what God did in distinguishing the one from the other. It was important enough for Paul to write half a chapter on it. Well, where does he go next? At the end of 1 Corinthians 14, he comes back to this issue of male-female distinctions. And there he's talking at the end of, um, again, this long list of public worship practices. He's talking and concluding that matter and gets to these words where he says this in verse 33, the second half of verse 33. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy, do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. And some people say, wow, finally, of all the confusion you were going through earlier in the book, you finally came out and just said what you needed to say, women, stop. And, um, and then men, you can do the prophesying, etc." cetera. And the question is, is that what Paul was saying? Well, to say that, you do have to nullify almost entirely what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And that is a strong thing to say because you are then using an apostle to undo an apostle. And even though you're basing it on apostolic authority, that authority is going out the window the minute you do it, right? Probably not the best way to understand what's going on. Well, what is the best way? There are a number of ways to take this and a number of reasons why a number of those ways aren't worth taking. What is um, worth seeing here? Well, understanding this in context, you have to understand this in context. And first Corinthians chapter 14, the last part of it is about the weighing of prophecies. So Paul's giving out this order, right? But all things should be done decently and in order, speaking in tongues, right? or prophesying, right? These things should be done in order. Now, these are somewhat foreign to many of us. Um, these are not um, practices that we are, um, that we understand as much as we could. Um, uh, put that aside from the moment. I can't, we can't solve everything in one night. Um, but what's the order? Well, he's, he's laying out, um, Again, how specifically tongues, but then also prophesying, right? This issue of prophesying. He's saying, you meet together when you're together and the people of God are together and God's going to speak and he does speak. When he does, let two or three individuals prophesy, right? Let them speak truth over God's people, right? If you just want a more amicable way of saying it. Let them speak truth and then weigh it right? Because you're not going to be speaking apostolic truth. You're not me, right? Paul says. But God is going to speak. Weigh it. Sometimes when he speaks, when somebody thinks he's speaking, it's just going to be indigestion. 
sometimes when he speaks, it's going to be a word that he's speaking into our context um, by the truth of his word spoken afresh over his people. This is going to be God communicating in a unique way. First Corinthians chapter 14, that's what he's speaking about. What is he saying then here, though? Well, he's saying at this point that when it comes to the weighing of prophecies, women are not to take part in the public weighing of what is true and what is not. Why? Because while they are invited to pray and prophesy, head cover, they are not to participate here because they will be forced to overstep the bounds, to adjudicate, to judge between the truths spoken by, in part, God's men. They are going to be put in a position where they're weighing those they are supposed to be under, right? Whether that's their own husbands or the men who've been appointed to lead the church or maybe the future men who have been appointed to lead the church. And that will not just in appearance, but functionally be disregarding the distinctions in design and duty that God has set up. So don't do it. You're welcome to at home ask questions when it comes to the truth that was spoken by someone or another. But don't enter into that of being the one who's going to judge between one or the other. Leave that to the men of the church that have the responsibility of leading and judging and correcting, and training and explaining and directing that God's appointed, right? So what does that mean? Well, that would mean that a woman would help by respecting the God-given responsibility of men, whether that's in their family or in the family of God, the men who all have that responsibility, and refraining from the public weighing of men, right? From the correcting, right? The digging in and having authority over. We're going to define more of that next week. Let me give you thoughts, and then I got one more section to make it through. Any questions on that? Any comments on Deborah, who was explicitly judging for the people of Israel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a question, right? It's a question of of um, and and I think this is where we need to we need to be really precise with language and acknowledge that we're imprecise in other places. What does it mean for her to be judging under a tree, the tree of Deborah in the book of Judges? Yes, it's judging language. And I'm using that language for the, um, even the, a, a role that I would reserve for the elders, pastors of a church. Is it the same thing? I'm not sure if it is. I'm not sure if it is. Um, uh, is it the same thing? Does it mean that a woman can't pursue a law career and the next woman who's going to replace the notorious RBG, um, you know, couldn't be a woman, that she's outside the confines of God's distinct design and duty for her? I don't think so. Um, I don't think that's what it's talking about. Um, I, I think if we're looking for a consistent call of the New Testament, what Paul is saying, and Paul, I think, says this best, is women do not right, have authority or teach, teach in the sense of disciple. Do not call someone to account and walk them up into maturity in the faith. That's not your job, right? I mean, similarly, as I, I would encourage any young guy to refrain from discipling a young woman, right, um, you know, even if he thinks he's going to marry her, like, just wait till you are married to her, buddy. Like, but in more of a way, why? Because this, this 
disregards again the, the design and duties that have been given over to men and the responsibility of helping right it's not being a necessary ally at that time it's coming to the table with the plan of attack and you're supposed to be the help right you're supposed to be coming in and yes helping save the day but 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 not because you're taking the lead or wrenching from um from those who do have the responsibility that responsibility for yourself now deborah at the level she was doing it i don't know i don't know if i'm uncomfortable with that um she's not presented right it's not presented as a woman who was taking authority where she shouldn't have there's no indication of that and you would expect an indication the only indication we have is maybe even to ron's point um, is that this was a time really where everything was haywire and maybe God was using a woman where he would have typically used a man, but there were no men, you know, to put in that. And again, that's a very nuanced argument to go back to Deborah of, of, of again, that phrase that's not used. It doesn't say, and then God raised up Deborah, right? It doesn't say that. Not that God didn't raise her up, right? But that refraining from that those words allude to the fact that something's not right in Denmark, right? Or where was Deborah, the tree of Deborah? Um, yeah, it's a bigger issue. And I think, I think, I think, I think on something like this, you want to land what's on what's clear and refrain from building off of what's not. And so that's why I would skirt the question almost. <laughs> Let me just trace this through quick, a few of um, Paul's other letters. What's, what's Paul saying in something like Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, where he says something like this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What's he saying? Is this contradictory? Because that is a strong statement. There is no male and female. That is strong. What is going on? What is Paul addressing here? Well, again, read everything in context, right? Stop and listen. We learned that principle a couple weeks ago, then stay on the line, right? What is the line? What's Paul arguing here? Paul's argument here is, is his, this is his great argument for justification by faith alone, right? That's what he's getting at here. And this is in the context of his exposition of the purpose of the law, which in Paul's words was to be a guardian leading to sonship, right? A slave guardian leading to sonship. And Paul's point here is that this sonship is available regardless of one's religion, a religious heritage, regardless of one's society, uh, societal position, and regardless of one's biological gender, right? It is a wonderfully encompassing statement, probably aimed at the prayer that Jewish men used to recite each morning, the, the kabod it was called, that thank God you didn't make me a Gentile, thank God you didn't make me a slave, thank God you didn't make me a woman. Paul says that justification by faith in Christ is available to all of them, right? That's the idea. Heirs according to the promise. What is Paul not saying? That in the church, right? He says in Christ, there is no male or female. In the church, though, right, this is some this is somehow undone the god-given authority structures that he affirms elsewhere no in the church the distinction in design and duty stands the creation distinction the recreation distinction right and whether that stands on into eternity right when we are just in christ you know we could talk about that but for the church right this doesn't undo what paul says elsewhere it merely emphasizes what he's saying here. Justification is available to all, right? The distinction though is upheld, right? 
So you get to something like Colossians 3, 18 and 19, you hear something like this. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, right? It's nice that that's qualified as is fitting, right? There's probably some ways that are not fitting, but there's ways that you could do it as is fitting, right? Husbands, on the other hand, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This then is just is just um, fleshed out further in Ephesians, right? I think Paul, pr pretty much, we could argue this, right? Paul had the notes next to him of what he had written, right? Either either of Ephesians and summarize that in Colossians, or he had Colossians and he then fleshed that out in Ephesians, right? And, and in Ephesians, he really fleshes this part out, right? Talking first, right? Sing to one another, right? Do this whole... Um, encourage one another with songs and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the relationship we're all supposed to have. Submitting to one another. That's what we call to everybody to, right? At KBC, that we want a relationship of mutual submission, um, encouraging one another in the faith. What? That actually is going to look particular in particular contexts, right? So yeah, we're submitting to each other, but what does that look like in husband and wife relationship? Well, this looks like wives submitting to their husbands and husbands loving your wives, right? Yeah, it's a particular relationship. Yeah, there's a general statement you can make of it, but if you're going to flesh that out in the particular, it's wives, you submit in this way. Husbands, the way that you play this out is you, you um, love your wives. You know, Christ, remember, his, he's your head, right? You love like he did, right? So it's a particular way. And you could trace that all the way through um, Ephesians right to the end where he says, um, let each one of you, right, husbands, love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love and respect, right? Love and respect. That's the two ways this works out. Other contexts, you draw, draw this out. What does this look like for a slave and a master, right? Well, slaves, submit to your masters. Masters, know that you're going to have to submit to another master, right? Children, he's not saying um, mom and dad submit to your kids, right? That's not, he's, he's, there is a particular way this works, right? Children submit to their parents. Parents know that you're under the Lord, right? So you got to submit to someone too, okay? All right, that's how he flushes it out. So that we could say what? If we're getting, coming back to this idea, what does it look like to help that in the... Pauline epistles, a, one, a woman helps by what? Standing in her blood bought justification as a child of God. That's part of helping out, like knowing that equal in value and worth and made equal in value and worth all the more by Jesus, but also honoring the God-given responsibility of her man, whether that's her man in her family, right? Dad, husband, honoring the responsibility that lays on his shoulders, not hers, his, right? Adam, where are you? right? Not her. Or in the family of God, the men who have been placed in positions of authority to be the big brothers and to bear the responsibility, right, for the family. That's what it looks like. Thoughts? We can talk about where else you would go. Um, to flesh this out. This again just um, repeats. Next week, um, next week we're going to get into um, some of the more particular passages in um, the pastorals in First Timothy um, and Titus a little bit, right? Of what it looks like um, in the offices of the church. Okay, so eldership. We we'll touch on deacon stuff. To ask the question about deaconesses and what this looks like. How do you draw this line all the way through? But if we're just going to summarize again, what's tonight? What would I say? Okay. What does it look like to help? It looks like to serve as an aid and ally in the work of God. This is a very, the base definition of that, as an aid and ally. To speak truth, the truth of God's word over God's people. Speak it, not explain it, right? I'm not, not hold people accountable to it, not go around and, and be the judge, but to speak, yes, speak it. And even to speak it into the ears of leaders, right? Right? I mean, and we have women in the church that do that all the time. 
very good at speaking into the ears of the ears. Um, speak it, right? Ultimately, to hold accountable? No, right? That's not the relationship. But to speak the word of God and to speak openly, to prophesy the truth of God over God's people, I think that's here. And lastly, though, to submit to the self-sacrificial leadership of men, leading their families and the family of God. That's where we're going to end. But Jeff and I are here. If you want to ask questions openly, you can, or online. If anybody needs to go, we understand. Um, but we'll take, I mean, let's leave it for 10 minutes and see where it goes. Um, if you want to ask questions. And if not, we could just talk privately or if you want to whisper things in my ear you are welcome does that make sense as a picture it's just trying to cope with the expanse of the bible Right? And there's a lot there. I think one of the things, I mean, Ron, to your point before, I think one of the places we can go with this is you can try to, you can try to explain away by whatever context you're in, right? That this is not normative. The weight of scripture entirely, though, I think speaks against that. That may, in a time, like for Deborah, I think it's an open question of, was this what God would have had, right? You're not told explicitly. The narrator doesn't come out and just give you the clue, right? It's ambiguous enough that it could be argued either way, but it's arguable. But to try and make sense of the breadth of it, you have a weight here that speaks against at least the pigeonhole that we've created for women in the church. Not that there is no line. Paul, we've seen that in Paul. Next week, we're going to dive into the passage. He, he says that most explicitly um, in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. But that doesn't even undo the rest of the weight of Scripture that says, wait, when you get there to saying a woman should not teach or have authority over a man, don't undo, right? all of the, the breadth of the rest of scriptures witness that women do have an enormous role to play, even in these things, speaking the word of God, even there, right? It's a fine line, I think, a distinction to make. It's a hard one to keep to. I think, I think there, there's a grobby toss to it that ought to weigh over any of us. It weighs over me. I'll just speak personally for me and Catherine. We're constantly asking where that line is. Have we crossed that line? Do we backpack, backpedal from that line? There's a gravitas to it of trying to honor God and the design that God sort of put into creation and his recreated family. But there's enough on the other side that says, wow, this isn't important. That means we should struggle with the tension. We shouldn't just undo that. I'm, I'm saying, I think you need to live in the tension. Like, I think there's, like in Ephesians, right? Submit to your husband as it's fitting in the Lord. There's these caveats, right, that are written into Scripture that you say, oh, is, is, that, 
is that a place that gives me, you know, I, 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 I can only follow you so far. I can't follow you into sin. I can't follow you into just writing sin off as if that's not a problem or as if we don't want better for you. But on the other hand of that, right, holding your husband or wife accountable and, and specifically as a wife to a husband, I, I think to know that you go into those situations and need to tread awful lightly because and carefully because you 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 have the ability to in that moment while wanting to speak truth into a situation you have um the ability and maybe more so in a situation like that to undo right the male female distinction right to strip your husband of the responsibility rather than call him to it and so i think it's i think similar to to sort of back off the sort of real emotional moment of doing that as a spouse, the question of whether women should teach seminary classes. I don't think the Bible prohibits that. A woman speaking as a scholar about some issue related even to the Bible, as if they can do that as a biologist, but not as a New Testament professor. But I think for a woman in a seminary, tra training up, right, how to read the Bible better, right, a, a classroom of individuals, many of which are going to be filling the role in a pulpit someday, I think that a woman in that situation, as is the guy sitting in, behind the desk, they ought to feel tense about it because a situation like that is you're much more apt to cross lines, right, and need to backpedal. I think too, like just thinking of what you were saying, I'm, I'm thinking of that um, marriage conference we went to, love and respect, just the way in which kind of to your point of the intention behind it, you know, that you can, um, you know, bring them to scripture and everything, but do it in a way that does not strip them of their respect. And, you know, like, I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong and you need to do this. And so it is kind of the sense of, um, an intention and, um, and that is a fine line, right? It is. And, and I think there's also, there's a reason why we have the support of the family of God. When you're struggling as a, a, a wife, you have brothers in the faith that you can go to that they will either say, listen, you're kind of off your rocker here, or they will can take that issue themselves and then hold their brother accountable to it and shepherd through that. Um, and I guess I would just, I would also speak to the guys that are part of the conversation to say, that's not to say you can't invite your wife to speak into your life, which I know you do, I do, to say, hey, we're in this together. I mean, and, and it, it gets into all kinds of sort of side conversations about, you know, husbands and wives who are believers, aren't believers, and you know, how, where you're at in your faith and those sorts of things. But to be able to say, for guys to say to their wives, in certain, you know, in, in the right way, whatever is befitting your relationship, I need you to be part of my accountability. There's nothing that, that prohibits that by any means, yeah. you know. It's just where that, where that dynamic is, yeah. is going to play out in in one specific couple is going to look different than another couple. And I think there's a reason why Paul brings this up a couple times in various contexts. It's because he knows this line gets crossed um, and that this is a, a tension point. And I, and I think for us, I, I think we need to recognize that too. Like, it's not as if after he spoke it, it's like everything was fine and dandy. Like we're going to struggle through this, right? Um, staying on the line of scripture is not just a like, oh, great, now I know what it says, all, all's well, right? It's, it's the constant struggle to, even like Paul t tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy, right, last words, not just stay on the line, hold the line, right? Because you're going to want to run the other direction sometimes, or everything in you is going to speak against that, or you're going to be caught between, you know, two truths, right? And having the choose the lesser of two evils sometimes. That's this broken world we live in, right? But I think Paul's trying to navigate through that. On the one hand, affirm the design, affirm the distinctions, while at the other, right, leave room to say, wait a minute, but there's a place here too. And so speaking truth was sort of my way of saying, hey, there is ambiguity here. 
and there, there seems to be a place, right? Go and tell them to go to Galilee, right? You're telling me to command other men to do something like, and to walk to them to say, thus said the Lord to me, go to Galilee. Like that seems, whew, well, I, yeah, but that's not, you know, and Peter, by the way, you know, that, you know, backdoor sin that you've, you've had, you know, we need to talk about that later. Uh, it's not your place to talk about that. You know, go tell one of his brothers to talk to him about it, right? But this is family, right? This is how family operates. I think the hard piece about it is the biblical middle is messier than we would like. But if we're going to honor the Bible, I think that's the middle that we're left with this side of things being made right for good. And it's a tension. It's a tension. If you do away with the tension, though, you risk, again, muting half the church, half of God's people, right? Um, you miss sucking the power out of, uh, out of half the family, right? You miss, right? What would we do as husbands without wives who, who spoke openly and, and, and who we respected that, you know, the spirit lives in them as well, not shucking the responsibility, not saying, Hey, can you go into the mess rather than me? Hey, this one, I'm a little tired. Can you run first and foremost into the next fight before I do like not that, but what would we do if we, if we lose that partnership, whether with our sisters or with our spouses or, or, or anything else? Maybe the question would be, what would Christ do? I mean, really, it, your husband and wife relationship is supposed to be reflecting what's going on in the God. Right? If it's not, if my motives are how I dress or how I act or whatever it is, for Christ's sake first, there's no way I can do that for anybody else. Absolutely not. I have no power. But if I have the love of Christ in me and through me, and then I can do whatever it is he's called to us. As a, as a man, there's no way you could force your wife to submit. That would be, that would be just outright, not only foolish from a leadership viewpoint, mm -hmm. but foolish from a godly viewpoint. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, your flip side is you have the other side of it with the lady who wins her husband without a word. Mm -hmm. So, you have to put Christ in now. That's the motivator factor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 he's telling us what to do, but you can't do that yeah. without. Yeah, well said, Ron. It's good. It's a good spot to end. Yeah, <laughs> it's late. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Next week, we'll jump into um, the pastorals. <laughs>